Welcome to the Disability and Philanthropy Forum's learning series. My name is Emily Harris. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm proud to be part of the disability community. I'm the Executive Director of the Disability and Philanthropy Forum and come to you today from the unceded land of the Council of Three Fires, the Ottawa, Ojibwe, and Potawatomi Nations, now known as Chicago. As part of our commitment to accessibility, our panelists and I will each provide a brief audio description of ourselves. I'm a white woman with dark curly hair, wearing glasses, a blue top, and a colorful scarf. Behind me is a white and tan screen. My access needs are met today because we have cart captioning. A few housekeeping items. There are two ways to access our live captions today. Use the CC button at the bottom of your screen or to access the captions in a separate window, see the link to the external captioner in the chat. Today, only our moderators and panelists will be on camera. You will be muted throughout the event. The webinar is being recorded and you will receive a link to the recording in the next few weeks. Although we will be using the chat to share links with you, it will not be available for you to communicate out. Instead, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to share your questions anytime during the session. We will try to integrate them into the discussion as they come in, and we will also make time for questions at the end. If the Q&A is not accessible to you, feel free to send your questions via email to communications at disabilityphilanthropy.org. We'll be po live posting on X, formerly known as Twitter today, and hope that you will join us on social media using the hashtag disabilityphilanthropy. You can also follow along by connecting with us on X at disphilanthropy. Before we start today's conversation, just a short reminder that disability is a natural part of the human experience. One in four U.S. adults, 61 million people, have disabilities, and our community continues to grow as the population ages and as people contract long COVID, other chronic illnesses, mental health, and other conditions where society creates barriers to full participation. Today, we will engage the perspectives of five advocates working at the intersection of disability and labor. As we begin this webinar, we honor disabled workers like Janika Perry, a black disabled woman who lost her life on the job due to systemic ableism. We have a poll question to help set the context for our conversation today. Please answer it now via the box that just popped up on your screen, if you don't mind multitasking a bit while I talk. If the poll is not accessible to you, please feel free to email communications at disabilityphilanthropy.org or note in the Q&A. I will read the question and choices now. On average, disabled workers earn approximately what percent less than workers without a disability? 20%, 52%, 9%, or 30%? To moderate our panel, I'm delighted to introduce Rebecca Vallis, Distinguished Fellow and Senior Advisor at the National Academy of Social Insurance and a true thought leader in disability inclusion, rights, and economic justice. Rebecca is joined on the panel by four, dis four advocates working at the intersection of disability and labor rights. You can learn more about the panelists from their bios that are linked in the chat. Before we start the correct poll answer, please. The correct answer is D, disabled workers earn approximately 30% less than workers without a disability. You'll hear more from our panelists about the many barriers facing workers with disabilities. So I see that 30% uh, of you 
identified the correct answer. Uh, no, sorry about that. 39% identified the correct answer of 30%. Rebecca, please take it away. Thank you so much, Emily, and hi, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be with everyone today and to be with the Disability and Philanthropy Forum fam. Um, my name is Rebecca Vallis. Um, I use she, her pronouns, and I am a white woman with increasingly long, dark, curly hair. Um, it's brownish. Um, I'm wearing dark purple lipstick. Um, I've got on gold earrings that look kind of like angel wings, um, and I'm wearing a black shirt and black jacket, and I have a whole bunch of books behind me because I'm sitting in a library. Um, and I'm a former legal aid lawyer who turned into a policy advocate after witnessing so many of the structural and policy barriers that people face um, who are low income and particularly folks who are low income and disabled. And I've spent most of my career working to help policymakers as well as philanthropy understand that when four, one in four Americans live with disabilities, as Emily said, every policy issue is a disability issue. And that's why I've so appreciated and so enjoyed the forum's learning series. Um, and it's it's a lot of fun to get to be part of um, some of these conversations. Um, I'm zooming in from Washington, D.C., from the National Academy of Social Insurance's library. That's why you can see all these books behind me. Um, and the building that I'm in today in Washington, D.C., is on land that was taken many, many years ago from the Piscataway tribe. Um, I am particularly honored to have the privilege of moderating today's conversation um, and have honestly really been looking forward to this conversation ever since the forum reached out to ask me to moderate it, because while there has been some real progress in recent years when it comes to awareness among the public, among policymakers, and in particular among philanthropy, that every issue is a disability issue, an area that still too rarely gets discussed with a disability lens is workers' rights and labor organizing. And we have just a phenomenal panel with us today to help us understand that intersection between disability justice and the labor movement. So um, as Emily noted, bios are being linked in the chat so that we can get right into today's discussion. But I'm going to go ahead and welcome each of our panelists today. Um, Marissa Torelli um, uh, Pedevska, Monica Lucas, Joan Morris, and Muna Abhari. Um, and I'm going to welcome all of them to the virtual stage with me today. Um, thank you so much to all of you for being with us for this conversation. Um, and to kick us off, I'm going to ask each of you to share a brief self-introduction that includes your pronouns um, and also a visual description. So um, Marissa, let's start with you, and then we'll turn next to Monica, Joan, and then Muna. Marissa? Thanks so much, Rebecca. Um, my name is Marissa Trelli Pedevska. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm a white woman with uh, mid-length brown straight hair, wearing a green turtleneck in front of a white wall with three framed photographs. And we'll go next to Joan, uh, we'll go next to Monica. Thank you. Hi, I'm Monica. It's so great to be here. Um, I'm a Puerto Rican woman with shoulder length brown hair, glasses, a black shirt, and my Zoom background is the densest, greenest jungle you've ever imagined. <laughs> it truly is. Um, I love it. Joan, we'll go next to you. Oh, and Joan, I think you're on mute. Can you come off mute for us? There you go. Am I off mute now? Oh, okay. Um, hi, I'm Joan Morris. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. I'm wearing black glasses, uh, a white, black, and a white and black scarf. Uh, my shirt is white, and I'm an African American woman. Wonderful. And then last but certainly not least, um, Mona. Hi, everyone. My name is Mona. Uh, she, her. I am a Palestinian woman. I am wearing a cheetah print shirt, some gold jewelry, gold earrings, soft pink makeup, and I am in my uh, bedroom. And I'm really happy to be here. Back to you, Rebecca. 
Well, thank you so much to all of you for joining for this. Um, and we're going to start by grounding the conversation in giving each of you the chance to talk a little bit about how your personal story and your lived experience have shaped how you see and navigate society. And, and then we'll get to turn into um, areas that all of you have um, significant expertise um, in at this intersection. But I appreciate the, um, the forums wanting to start the conversation really with grounding and lived experience. So Joan, we're going to start with you. How has your personal story and your lived experience shaped how you see and navigate society in the US? Um, as an African-American woman, um, I look at my experience as I've had to learn every lesson the hard way. Um, with, um, with, dis with disabilities especially, uh, one of the hardest things I've had to learn um, is that you have to be your own advocate. Mm -hmm. um, I saw my mom not, for example, I saw my mother not being able to speak for herself and work very long hours um, as a housekeeper. And when her body finally like gave out and broke down, they fired her instead of giving her a better alternative. And she struggled to make ends meet until she died in April of 2023. So I've had to learn you have to be your own advocate and you have to speak up for yourself because if you do not, you will be taken advantage of. I appreciate so much you sharing that. And I'm, I'm so sorry for your loss. And I know we're gonna get a lot more into um, some of the issues underlying that very personal story that you've just shared. But thank you, Joan, for starting us off with that. Monica, I'm gonna hand it over to you next with the same question. Yeah, so um, I'm a Puerto Rican woman on the autism spectrum. So I, I think I one of the challenges is that, is having learned to sort of hide the things that are different about me. And, and I think growing up as a kid with autism, masking is a big part of that, especially as a girl. Um, and so to me, sort of my like journey in my adulthood is trying to re-accept those parts of myself that I felt like I wasn't supposed to. And I think that is broadly true of folks in the disability community because we are expected to perform at the same uh, physical standards or whatever our limitations might be, we're expected to pretend like they don't exist and to push through and try and meet the expectations regardless of what we're capable of. Um, and so I think for me, my experience has taught me to try and respect what I'm capable of and, and allow myself to have some grace and to also give that grace to other people when they need it. I love that. Um, and uh, Muna, you'll get the next chance. Same question to you. Yeah, um, so I am a uh, Palestinian woman um, and I grew up in a Muslim family. Uh, I try to uplift the the struggle of my people in, in everything that I do. Uh, we grew up in a small town outside of St. Louis and at a young age, I quickly learned the impacts of, of prejudice on myself and my family after 9-11 and the rise of Islamophobia. Um, I had to learn how to navigate the world as an Arab, as a Palestinian, as a woman of color. Uh, fast forward to college, I was struggling to keep up with school um, for disabilities of mine and in and, and other life uh, instances. And I also was just struggling to juggle three jobs while going to school. And at one point, I even experienced homelessness because I, I couldn't afford housing. Um, and my parents are also low wage workers, and I see how they navigate the world in an economy that doesn't support working people. Um, so all that really changed just how I see the world and the world that I want to live in. Um, my parents shouldn't have to break their back for a paycheck, uh, and I shouldn't have to be facing extra hurdles just because I'm a woman of color. Um, I think it's extremely important to ground myself in my lived experiences so I know what kind of world that I want to fight for, where myself, my family, and everyone is treated um, with dignity and respect. Mm -hmm. I feel like a through line that's already developing through what everyone's sharing, right, is that it doesn't have to be this way. And, and yet these are the structural barriers and, um, and, and sources of policy violence that so many people face. Um, and Marissa, you'll get the, um, the last crack at that opening question before we get a little bit more into some of the thrust of today's conversation. 
Yeah, thank you, Monica, for bringing up the, um, you know, needing to reaccept yourself experience. Um, as someone with a disability, I like really um, relate to that. I uh, have chronic illnesses and a number of invisible physical disabilities that have really changed and progressed throughout my life. So for most of my life, I didn't identify as disabled. I didn't identify as chronically ill. And then as I got older, um, and I started to meet other people like me for the first time or, you know, social media is actually a huge thing for me getting to see other chronically ill people on social media for the first time I was like, oh, wow, there are other people like me out there um, sharing their story. Um, but I think having an invisible physical disability for me has has really reshaped the way that I think about um, everyone's individual needs. I kind of go into every situation assuming that there are people in the room with disabilities that like I can't see. Um, and I think so often we assume that if we can't see it, uh, that the person doesn't have a disability. Um, and just because of the way that I've experienced the world, um, I kind of always assume the opposite. And I like to think it's really helped me, um, you know, think about people's individual needs, honestly, whether they have a disability or not, because because we've all got we've all got needs. I really appreciate you bringing that up, Marissa, and obviously that intersects with some of what Monica was sharing about masking, right? Um, and uh, it, it, so, and I also just on a personal level appreciate you bringing up invisible disabilities. That's part of my story as well. Um, and it's not something that people generally um, know about me unless I bring it into a conversation. Um, and that's the story for so many people with chronic illness and other disabilities that might not be readily apparent to the eye. Um, Muna, I'm going to bring you in next and uh, really to sort of lay a little more scaffolding for this conversation. It feels like you're the right person to take us to that next level of, of bricks. Um, uh, so given your perspective and your experience as an organizer, and in particular as someone who's got some real experience organizing disabled workers, um, would you help us set the table a little bit for today's conversation with the bird's eye view? And, and I'm going to ask you to do that, recognizing that many people who are listening in today might be new or newer to thinking about the intersection section of disability justice and labor organizing. So um, maybe the right place to, to start, and the way I'll pose this question to you is, can you give us a high level view of what disabled workers in the US are experiencing and how you approach the intersection of workers' rights and disability justice? Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to try my best to, to kind of have a you know, higher bird's eye view of, of the intersection. But I think um, I'm also going to refer to examples of my personal work just to give an idea of, of what I've come across and what disabled workers um, at, at companies face all across, you know, historically and across the world. So the labor movement <clears throat> is about workers essentially having a voice and demanding respect and justice, right? And that manifests in multiple, multiple ways. Um, disabled workers have been ignored and disrespected and kept from thriving on the job um, forever, right? Workers want to be seen as people, and I've realized by doing this work that um, companies, especially multi-billion dollar companies like Amazon, for example, do not treat their workers like people. In fact, they just see them as numbers and as expendable, right? Um, in fact, they may even see them as not useful to because they they can't quote unquote produce enough um, in order to make to to make profit. So it's putting profits over people. Um, their processes and their systems are dehumanizing for all workers, and often disabled workers aren't really given a chance to succeed in these workplaces. As a field organizer at United for Respect, which is a national nonprofit organization that supports retail workers organizing for better pay and working conditions, I've come to realize that there really is no labor movement without disability justice. So for example, on our Amazon campaign, um, we've worked with warehouse workers like Joan here um, across the country over the past several years, helping them fight for higher wages and improve safety on the job and better benefits. Time and time again, while speaking to these workers, um, we just kept coming across uh, employees who were struggling to have their disabilities honored and their workplace accommodations met and respected at work, um, which is really insulting because at a place like Amazon, and, and it's not just Amazon, multiple companies do this, Amazon's PR machine touts the company uh, company's inclusion of, of disability workers, right? They pride themselves in being a, a, a workplace that advocates for disability uh, justice and, and disabled workers when we know that on the ground that is like couldn't be further from the truth, unfortunately. 
Um, so many of these workers actually had to, uh, many of these impact workers had to quit in frustration. Some were on indefinite leaves of absence um, lasting months while the company assessed their request for accommodations and others were working without accommodations as best as they could, which we, that, that's not okay. Um, we at United Res for Respect decided that we needed to organize a campaign around this issue, issue to respond to the repeated concerns we were hearing from current and former employees. Um, given the astronomical turnover rate at Amazon, we wanted to include former Amazon employees in our campaign as well, since we know their voices and then since they were pushed out of the workplace because their accommodations were met are uh, especially important. Usually labor campaigns are organizing workers within a workplace, but uh, many of our leaders that uh, had been forced out due to their disability or lack of meeting accommodations for their disability um, was an, actually a really new approach to organizing and really hard too <laughs> when you can't organize workers that are in the workplace and, and have been pushed out uh, of a company. It's really hard to get them to connect to other workers as well. Um, so in a traditional worker organizing model, you help workers speak to their coworkers on the job. And again, that was just extremely difficult um, navigating that at Amazon. And I know others in other labor sex have also experienced the same thing. So it's just, it's a call for a new strategy when it comes to organizing, especially when you really wanna make sure you have a disability justice lens to your organizing. And I'll just wrap up wrap up by saying disabled workers are workers that make these companies their billions and more importantly they are people when we talk about building people power in the labor movement we can't ignore the fact that we have disabled workers all across the workforce and they deserve to live in a world where disabled disabled workers thrive i wholeheartedly believe that you cannot talk about the success of the labor movement without disability justice a new strategy, but also just a, a more inclusive strategy, right? That's what you're that's what you're describing. Um, and um, I think that's going to be the the call to action throughout this conversation, right? There's no labor movement without disability justice. Joan, um, I, I want to turn to you next. Um, now that um, we've we've heard some of that bigger picture landscape, which of course includes, but is far from limited to to just Amazon. Um, and I, 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 I'd like to have you help us ground our conversation just a little bit further in lived experience. You've worked at Amazon, you've also worked at other employers, um, and, and the experiences you've had at those places led you to become an organizer, particularly of disabled workers. Talk a little bit about your experience and share how it led you to organizing. Um, thank you. Um, what led me to organizing was, um, I think what led me to a large part to organize was January. It started in around January to March. Um, I I had to go to uh, I went to an Amazon plant in East Point because due to my accommodations, um, it was the only option that I had at the time because no other. Um, no other site would take me because of my accommodations, even though it would be a two hour bus ride from here, from, to, from my house to the job site by bus. Um, it was, I gave them, I went to my doctor and gave them the accommodations stuff, but what was supposed to, I was supposed to get my accommodations approved in March. It took them 10 months. It took them till October, 2023 to approve the, com the accommodations. And during that time, I had to do a lot of heavy lifting. I had to move a lot of boxes and it got extremely painful. So much so that I would have to like sit at the job site, wait 20 to 30 minutes before I walked to the bus stop so my muscles can rest. Um, I have uh, osteoarthritis. Uh, it's a degenerative disease and it's a genetic disease of the bones where they start, rub the bones start rubbing together and the muscles start to tear. Um, I, th I think the hardest part for me was after all I've been through and the loyal, I always thought that if I was loyal to the company, did my job, 
always showed up on time and it did good that they would treat me with the least respect and return the loyalty back and try to be helpful, but that wasn't the case. I had to fight every ounce of the way to get help, to get accommodations. And of course, we are talking about reasonable accommodations, right, which are actually required by law to be provided, right? And we're, we're talking about a 33-year-old civil rights law here, the Americans with Disabilities Act. That's that's the context here for the accommodations that you were requesting. Um, uh, is there more you want to share about the path then into organizing and your experience becoming an organizer because of the experience you had as a worker? Well, the path that led me to like organizing was at, at first I attended a meeting with the UFR. I was scared at first. I was like, how, let's see what, how they're going to make the, um, how they're working. And it turns out along with my fellow coworkers and organize, organizers that these were like, they really knew their stuff that they really, that they had, we, we would organize, have meetings about how we would get changes fixed in the, um, it, at the warehouse and everything like that. And for the most part, we've successfully done some accommodations and got them approved. We were, for example, we were able to get fans in the facility where there weren't any, um, we were able to get uh, representatives to come in to see what we were going through on a daily basis. Um, and basically we held management to task. We still have more work to do, but we held management to task that year. Um, it, those small victories motivated me to further stay in it and work on on my advocacy and everything like that. Thank you so much for sharing that. And like you said, small victories that is what it might sound like, right? But often the accommodations that people need are, are actually fairly small from the employer's perspective and yet can mean the difference between whether someone is able to do their job or or is is not um, because of denial of, of what can be very basic accommodations. I know we'll hear more about that as this conversation continues, but um, uh, Marissa, I want to turn to you next um, to bring in the perspective of a leader in philanthropy who's been doing a lot of work at this intersection of disability, justice, and, and, and work organizing. You're at the Inevitable Foundation, um, and Inevitable has a pretty amazing story of supporting disabled screenwriters through the 2023 Writers Guild of America strike that people probably remember very well from last year. Would you tell that story for us and um, the context uh, that I'll imbue that question with is um, what can philanthropy learn from Inevitable's model of supporting disabled workers in this way? Absolutely. Um, thank you for that question. So when we knew the strike was probably going to happen, um, the first thing we did before the strike was even happening was trying to figure out like what people needed. So we surveyed disabled writers working in the industry, um, just to get a sense of, you know, the demand for, for funding, for grants, for support, um, trying to get a sense of like, if these people had savings, if they would be able to stay working in the industry, you know, if the strike lasted many, many months. Um, and it turned out the demand was really high. Um, people didn't have much savings. Um, people had healthcare costs, which was a huge, part of it because their healthcare was going to eventually run out during the course of the strike. Um, and so we really got a sense of people's needs um, very quickly. Um, and then the second thing we, or the next thing we did was once the strike started, um, we started the emergency relief fund where um, we distributed individual grants to people who applied and who, you know, who needed them. Um, and you know those were really life changing for for people. It kept people work in the industry and you know working in the industry. Um, people who may have had to leave and like go found found another job. 
Um, it helped people pay for health care, for you know, medical costs, all these things that disabled writers um, have that a lot of other writers don't really think about. Um, when it came to the picket lines, we, we worked hard to try and make those more accessible too. You know, so much of picketing is like walking and long hours and heat. Um, it was also, you know, very, very hot during those months. And so one thing we did was we brought chairs. It sounds very simple, but we brought chairs to the picket lines and it was pretty amazing to see how many people gravitated towards the chairs, even people who like maybe didn't have a disability. It was just something that like everybody needed. People just need rest. Um, and so it was a simple thing, but it was, it was, it made a big impact. Um, we brought an accessible bathroom to the picket line so that people could use the bathroom, um, basic human need. We brought water, cooling towels for people that had heat sensitivity or just people that were hot, right? These accommodations, these things that help disabled people just also help everybody. Um, we had cooling fans. Um, and so it, it also was a great way to like build community during the strike and just see a lot of people with different needs come together. Um, and then, you know, the last big thing we did was we had um, this billboard campaign and before the strike started, the billboard campaign was focused on hire disabled writers, not a disability consultant. And uh, once there was a strike and no one was hiring anybody, that messaging didn't really make much sense. So we very quickly pivoted. And that's something I'm really proud of and changed the messaging to the future, uh, which was the future of disabled writers is non-negotiable as a way to tie it into the strike. And so, um, you know, I think something that philanthropy could learn from, you know, our approach to the strike and to our, um, the way that we, we kind of acted fast is just, you know, ask people what they need and, and get it to them. I think we, we acted faster than maybe we typically would have. We distributed grants faster than maybe we typically would have or would have previously felt comfortable doing so, but um, it, people needed it now and they needed it fast. And so we kind of had to, to change with the changing demand um, and pivot our messaging as the, you know, the need change. So um, just acting fast, I think analyzing less and just you know, giving people what they need. And in this case, providing direct assistance, right? This wasn't yeah. sending a report that might look at the issue and decide what to do next year, right? It was actually providing right. assistance because that's what people needed. Um, Monica, I, I want to bring you back in to continue that story because you've got the perspective of a, a disabled person working in the film industry. Um, we've been hearing from Marissa a little bit about how Inevitable came to support disabled screenwriters during the strikes, but talk a little bit about your experience in the industry um, and and not just within the context of these strikes, but, but the workplace barriers that you and other disabled folks face um, in the film industry. Yeah, and and just to say, I was on the picket line with Inevitable during that time, and it really did make a difference, not just physically, but spiritually. Like people were really glad to have that kind of support, and it gave people the opportunity to go and be there who would otherwise not have been there. So really, really big help that Inevitable did during that time. Um, yes, so I am a screenwriter. Um, I've worked as a writer's assistant on a couple of shows, and. Um, and I've also worked as a production assistant on some movies. And um, I think sort of keeping with the theme that we've had so far, which is that the accommodations, the things that we need as disabled folks are not too unlike what people need to survive in normal life. Um, so I'll talk about my experience um, on these film sets because I think that it's the most salient uh, way of talking about it. Um, working as a production assistant, really anybody on a crew, but production assistants get the worst of it. Um, you're working, you're there before anyone else gets there, you leave after everyone else leaves. Um, on a film set, a standard day is 12 hours. If you have overtime, the crew can be there for 14, 16, 18 hours. And then as a PA, you're there for an extra two and a half or three hours on top of that. So there's a matter of like, what are you physically capable of handling? And if you have a physical disability or, um, the kind of limitation that simply doesn't allow you to be on your feet working for, you know, 15, 16, 17 hours a day. Um, you just simply cannot do that job. There are no, they, they, they do not have accommodations set up for you to take that job in the first place. So it's like an immediate, um, like siphoning off of folks who would want to be there who just literally are not welcome. Um, if you can make that happen and you can show up and do that work, 
um, you are the lowest person on the totem pole. So you do not have power to negotiate for your needs. Um, I, of the few PAs that I worked with on my most recent film, uh, they wouldn't, they did not say this to me up front, but through the course of working with them, I recognized they have disabilities. They have chronic illness. They have chronic pain. They had things that were getting in the way of them doing their job that they wouldn't even talk about, but being in their presence for that long, I started to see. And there were simple things that could have helped. One of the, one of the women I worked with had been doing this job for so long that she had developed chronic back pain and needed to sit down regularly. And that was a big ask to be able to just go take a five minute break and sit down. That was not really allowed. Um, one of my other colleagues had chronic pain uh, in the form of, of severe migraines that cause like photo and, and audio sensitivities. Um, well, when you're on a set with those big lights and all the noises and the walkie talkies in your ear, that's a very painful experience. And she needed to be able to go to like a dark room for five minutes and decompress and like relax and do her exercise, her stretches and exercises. And that was also, there was no room in the schedule for that. There was no room in the schedule to take a lunch break, to take a, a bathroom break. It was so intense. And these are, uh, these are just normal human things. These are not even things that folks with disabilities need. This is, these are things that everybody needs. So it was a really eye-opening experience um, to see how ignored these things are. So first of all, like I said, people who have severe enough physical disabilities are not even welcome on set. The ones who can get there are not allowed to advocate for themselves. Um, and then the ones who can suffer through it suffer long-term health and uh, and pain. Um, so it's a it's a horrible, like, I mean, I, I, I wanna be careful how I talk about this because like obviously that side of it is horrible. It's a fun environment, right? People want to do this work. They like working on sets. They want to make film and TV. It's exciting, it's, it's, it's fun. But the cost of that is your long-term health and your well-being. And I don't think that that should be the trade-off. I think you should be able to make a movie and also like get a full night's sleep. Um, the, the way that we do this, I think, is like we genuinely just have to reimagine what it means to have a film set and what it means to be a crew member and just come to accept that we're asking people to do things that are, uh, frankly, in my opinion, inappropriate. We should not be asking people to sacrifice their sleep and their physical well-being to make a movie. I don't think a movie is important enough for people to like take years off of their life. Um, so my perspective is as someone who's worked in these spaces and genuinely loves doing this work, I want it to be better so that I could do more. <laughs> like I want to I want to do this work, but I can't. And that to me is the the real tragedy here. There are a lot of people like me who would love to do this and are just not able to physically or or for other reasons. Monica, thank you so much for sharing all of that. And again, I, I feel like the two through lines emerging, right, that um, uh, there is no labor movement without disability justice. And also, it doesn't have to be this way, right? So many of the things you guys are talking about are, are um, things that we have been normalized uh, within the status quo, but it, it doesn't have to be this way. These are choices that um, our industries and our employers make. Um, and Marissa, I'm going to throw one other question back to you, just because I feel like it's come up so many times now in the conversation, and it's worth um, just digging into it just a little bit more. And, and that is the cost of a accommodations. Um, and uh, this this feels like probably one of the biggest myths and misunderstandings when it comes to um, disabled workers and um, what it means to have to to treat people with disabilities in the in the workplace um, adequately and appropriately. Um, uh, and you've actually dug into this uh, inevitable road hole report on this subject. Talk a little bit about um, what you think philanthropy could benefit from knowing about the cost of workplace accommodations and what you found. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a lot of the research that we've done specifically through our cost of accommodations report, um, I mean, that's through an uh, entertainment lens, but it applies to, you know, every every industry and it applies to to philanthropy. And I think there is this um this is misconception that that accommodations are tricky or they're expensive or they, you know, take a lot to make happen. And what we found for from our research is that's really um not true. It, it's not that hard. And um, in entertainment specifically, you know, it's actually very accommodating 
space if you think about it but you're you have to think about who's getting accommodated right like someone will get their private jet and their like specific brand of water that they need but someone else doesn't have a ramp or a bathroom or this thing that costs a fraction of the price but it's just not valued in the same way and so it's not really can we make accommodations happen it's like who's getting to benefit from those accommodations um but i do think that the, the simplest answer is that we found it's just really not that hard asking people what they need um, in every situation in every industry. It's just not that hard and um, making those conversations, um, making the, the, those conversations normal just really allows for an environment for people to feel like safe and feel like they can ask for what they need. I think we need to normalize those conversations in across every industry. Um, when someone starts a new job, you ask, you know, what can I do to make this job um, the best experience for you? What do you need to do your job well? Um, and so that, that, I know it sounds very basic, but that is really um, what we found. And I think we at Inevitable have built, we've built a majority disabled team and we've built and retained such an incredible team by making accommodations such a normal part of our culture. Um, people need something, they get something. People need to work from home, they work from home. I mean, we're, we're a remote um, organization, but you know, if people need a day off, they get a day off. People have a doctor's appointment, they go to the doctor. I think these things are quite simple. And so um, I think we've only built a, a stronger team and created a, a more fun uh, environment for everybody because of it. I appreciate so much you sharing some of those learnings, but also, right, it's just, some of it really is very basic, right? I mean, it's it's just as basic as centering the humanity of workers, right? As opposed to treating people like they're widgets, right? It, it really, actually, a lot of it is that that basic. Um, I want to bring um, uh, Muna and Joan back in one more time before we turn to some audience Q&A. So reminder, go ahead and keep putting in your questions, because we are going to have a little bit of time at the end for um, audience questions. But um, um Muna, I, I want to um, turn back to you for a moment. And um, one of the things that really came up when we were having our preliminary conversation about what we wanted to bring into this webinar today um, was um, uh, how you have learned to and how in your work you follow the leadership of disabled workers and what that looks like at um, United for Respect. Talk a little bit about how that shows up in your work and in United for Respect's model um, of working with and, and helping to organize disabled workers. Yeah, absolutely. So um, as an organizer, I've learned that um, I have to be willing to step back and actively listen um, to to disabled workers, to Amazon workers, to just just in organizing in general. Active listening is is such an essential part of really understanding the story and understanding how you can show up as an organizer as well. Um, to really understand the stories of the workers that they're sharing with me and where they're coming from, it's really important to understand the person as a whole too. Um, and then something also I've learned too is just as as disabled workers anywhere, but especially at Amazon, um, they've really been supporting and helping each other for a long time um, because out of out of necessity uh, almost because these companies don't uh, don't create a workplace uh, that is safe for them that is acceptable of them. Um, for example, there are Facebook groups with hundreds of members uh, where people, uh, I'm talking about Amazon specifically, but I'm sure it's it's, uh, it's probably replicated itself in, itself in other work sectors, but where people post their issues, getting accommodations, they share their stories, and it helps them feel a little less alone. So Lee, I've just seen workers take initiative on creating community, creating a group, creating a Support system that they should already have in their workplace and they should have in their lives, but they don't because the systems don't work for them. It's very ableist. And so they've had to, uh, I think Joan puts it beautifully, advoc advocate for yourself um, in multiple ways that you don't have to, but you have to to survive. Um, and another thing I've learned too is, especially, especially at Amazon, the hurdles that Amazon throws at disabled workers over and over and over again, puts them through uh, puts them through hell, honestly. Um, and it's enough to make any person really just give up and lose hope and walk away. 
and say that it's not worth fighting to keep this job. But a lot of workers, despite all that, decide to say, no, I'm fighting back. I'm staying here and you can't push me out of this company. I deserve uh, to work here and get a paycheck. I put my all in this company um, and you can't push me out the way that you're trying to push me out. And that is just incredibly inspiring when all the, like, again, the company is against them. It's hurdle after hurdle and they're still there, not even just there showing up, making sure that they get their job done, but actively play a role in making change at the workplace to make sure that it doesn't happen to any, that, that the injustices don't happen to anyone else again. Um, so Amazon wants them to walk away and they want them to be frustrated, but they don't, they don't give into that. And that's just incredibly, that speaks volumes in and of itself. Um, I've seen associates have to become their own lawyer, their own advocate, um, with, and with Amazon's deep pockets that fund an army of, you know, HR specialists and lawyers, workers still prevail. And it's, and it's been absolutely just an honor to be play, be able to play a supportive role in the people that know the problem the best and the solutions the best. There's so much we can learn from that, um, and, and and really within every component of folks who are are working on on social change. Joan, I, I want to um, bring you in one more time, and then we've got some really amazing questions coming in from the audience. So I want to make sure we've got time to bring several of those in. We're probably not going to have time to get into all of them, although I wish we'd had more time than we have because some of these are really terrific questions. Um, Joan, we have an audience um, watching today um, who is primarily leaders across philanthropy folks who are funding all kinds of social change work. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm curious if you have a message um, to them about how philanthropy can best support disabled workers. Um, and as my lights keep going out, so I have to dramatically wave my arms. There we go. My, <laughs> let there be light. Thank you. Um, uh, so how philanthropy can best support disabled workers, but also maybe how non-disabled people who are looking to be part of disability justice can best support disabled workers. Anywhere you want to take that. Um, thank you. Uh, first and foremost, the important thing to remember is that people with disabilities are first and foremost human beings. They have rights. They have the right to make a living. They have a right to, they have rights. They, they're not people that you sweep under the rug and pretend that they don't exist because they do, or you take advantage of. Uh, for those that are non-disabled, I encourage them to uh, read, uh, I encourage them to listen, actively listen first and foremost to the disabled people and let them be the center of the conversation and believe their stories. Also, uh, reading um, compilations, reading and also watching documentaries about disabled folks, uh, I recommend two. Uh, for uh, book-wise, I have here, um, the, it might show up in reverse, uh, Disability Visibility. It's edited by Alice Wong, and it has stories from people that are disabled across the country uh, and their experiences with dealing with disabled life. And uh, another a documentary I would recommend is Crip Camp. Um, it has, it's a beautiful story about the campers at Camp Janine, um, who before there was the passage of the ADA Act in, the, in 1990, there was another disability law called Section 504. Um, that's what led to the, cal and what, and what happened at Camp Janine led to the passing of Section 504, which led to the passing of ADA. And it tells a beautiful story about the activists who, who were a part of that movement during that time. So I those are the two I would recommend. I appreciate that so much, Joan. And I have to say, when you were saying believe disabled people, I was thinking, yes, Alice Wong, right? Because Alice so often says believe disabled people. Um, and 
I, I love I love your recommending her wonderful book and, and also Crip Camp. Um, so we're going to turn to audience Q&A. And again, we're not going to have time to get through all the questions being submitted, but there's some really terrific questions in here. So I'm going to go first to um, a question um, asking, if I am a funder of labor rights groups, what do I need to do to make sure my grantees are as educated as the inevitable foundation and united for respect when it comes to the rights of disabled workers? And where can my grantees find resources? I love that question. I feel like that's a great place to start. Um, and I'm going to see if anyone on the panel wants to kick off with that. I can jump in. Please do. Um, I mean, when I read this question, the, the, or when I hear this question, the first thing um, that I think of is just the importance of building initiatives with the community itself, because, you know, we are majority um, disabled team. We work with the community, but we also like are the community. And so, so much of what we've learned is, is from hiring people within the community itself. It's not so much um, finding external resources as it is uh, bringing people into the conversation into leadership positions who are actually a part of the community. So um, something I'd really encourage is, is putting disabled people in positions of leadership, um, hiring disabled people, um, making sure that they're part of the conversations. And you know, we're not just talking about how to best serve uh, the disability community, but but those conversations are, are being, facilitated by someone in the community and they're including people in the community because I think that's where we've really learned how to do the work. Um, yeah. Beautiful. And Muna, I don't know if you have anything to add to that um, or any resources you want to put on the table either. Um, no, no specifics that come to mind. I just want to back second what Marissa said. It, 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 the The best uh, resource is the community itself. And I, I'll also just say with like UFR's work, we have been doing this for, for a bit, but we also know that we are newer to the, to the like disability justice space. So we actually like re did outreach to, um, to people that have been doing this work much, much longer than us. And so a big takeaway for me was, was just the difference between like disability justice versus disability rights. Um, and they helped us just walk through like, how can we really make sure we have a disability justice lens with all that we do? So again, it was just, it was just seeking experts in the community, reaching out to um, those that have been doing this work for, for, for a long, long time. Um, and as this work is growing, as the labor movement's changing, we, we're going to have to adapt, but like looking to the past and looking to those before us and all they have done is, is really helpful too. Yeah, I love those answers. And, and I'll also say uh, probably talking directly to Inevitable and United for Respect, who I'm sure would also love to be resources to folks looking to learn. So here I am offering you guys up, but I assume that's okay with you. Um, the next question, Joan, might be one that you want to speak to. And Muna, you might have thoughts on this too, but Joan, um, how can we better educate workers about their rights to accommodations and how can we help them find support and mentors in the labor movement when they hit a wall with their employers? Do you have any thoughts on that question? Uh, yes. Um, what is in, I think the first and foremost importance is um, when you've hit a wall with your employer, um, it, you may have to look at other resources like um, legal aid, Legal aid not only provides legal representation, but also provides um, legal advice on what to do and what your rights are in regards to accommodations with a law uh, with the ADA. Because again, it is the it is it is the law, but it's a law, but it's a long, complicated law, and the folks at Legal Aid will be able to break that down. Um, also, also reach out to um, disability rights organizations to also figure out what to do in regards to your rights. Um, in regards, if you hit a wall with your um, with your employer, I love that. And Muna, anything you want to add? Um, uh, how we can better educate disabled workers about their rights to accommodations and and help them find mentors when they hit a wall with their employers. Yeah, I think I'll just 
kind of hi quickly highlight the example of a worker that I came across who helped that I brought up earlier who who started a Facebook group um fo solely focused on like disability uh, on accommodations at Amazon um and slowly and surely that they were able to build a community uh that were able to help nav like help workers navigate the you know the really broken system of accommodations at multiple employers as well um and people that uh yeah can bring that expertise into so just encouraging workers to self-organize um and and just second everything joan said as well um there's uh it, it it's difficult because we know that the economic like the the system itself is so broken that that as, especially like at Amazon, for example, the problem isn't just with like one department, for example, there's so many different, the, the process is so convoluted in and of itself that the solutions might be even a little blurry too because workers are sent everywhere. So um, it uh, second jo Joan's suggestions, but also like the importance of workers self-organizing and, pro and providing a support system for themselves as well. Yeah, I, I love that. Um, and um, we've got a, another question. I think we've got time maybe for me to ask one more and, and then we're going to run out of time, which breaks my heart because I'm loving this conversation, but I love this question. Um, uh, Monica, you spoke about being a screenwriter. Um, would you talk a little bit about how art um, and how screenwriting can be a form of activism? And I'll add activism when it comes to labor rights, but also activism when it comes to disability justice. Yeah, I'll start by saying I actually got my start working in Washington, D.C. as a political activist, um, and I wanted, I still do want to like make the world a better place. Um, I found that political activism didn't fit quite for me, and I wanted to move to Hollywood and tell stories because I think that stories are an incredibly beautiful element of the human experience that teach us how to be better people like we watch stories we watch movies read books um tell stories to each other because they're morals and they help us define our values and they help us understand other perspectives um and that to me is like the quintessential beauty of being a human so i'm i'm so glad that i get to be a part of storytelling because i think there are a few things in this world that like make me feel more proud of humanity now one of the best one of the best things about stories is that you can put yourself in the subjective experience of someone who's very very different than you so if you have no idea what it's like to be a person with a disability or a person of color or a person of a different socioeconomic class you can read a book or watch a movie or a tv show um and I mean, the magical thing happens where you become that person for a little while. You like really experience the emotions that they're going through and the feelings that they're having. And that to me is one of the most powerful tools of social change, of political activism and social activism. Because when we tell stories about people with disabilities or people of color or, or any of the, of the marginalized groups that often do get left out of stories, when we tell these stories, what we're doing is we're opening people's minds we're giving them an experience that they've never had before and we're making them more empathetic. And that is so great because we can't solve these problems unless we have empathy for each other. Um, we we can't convince, you know, uh, the Amazon management to do these things that they need to do unless they feel like they have to do them, right? Um, so to me, story is one of the most powerful tools of activism. Um, like I said, I didn't start in DC. I believe in political activism. I believe in policy and, and good governance. I think that's also very important. Um, from the storytelling perspective, I think that's another tool that we need to use. Um, and I'll just say one last thing. It's hard to know that there are problems to solve unless you don't see the problems. And folks with disabilities often aren't seen, whether because they're kept out of spaces physically or because their disabilities aren't visible. So you don't necessarily know that these problems need to be solved. And that's why we need to tell stories about them so that we can know that these people are out there and they deserve to be seen and heard. Which brings us right back around to what Joan was saying before, right? Um, with disability visibility, uh, being people telling their own stories, Crip Camp, of course, being a film um, that that tells these stories, right? This is why these these are the ways that um, we connect with the heart, right? As opposed to the head and we get to that place of, of empathy. So thank you so much for sharing all of that, Monica. And um, I, I hate having to end, like, I feel like the only bad part of today's conversation is having to end it. But um, thank you so much to Monica, to Muna, to Marissa, to Joan for joining us for this today. 
today. Um, and thanks to everyone who's been um, out there in cyberspace watching. And it's been a, a privilege getting to be part of this conversation and to moderate it. Um, and uh, thanks to the forum um, for putting it together. This was a really important discussion for philanthropy to hear. Um, and with that, um, uh, I will turn things back to Emily Harris to close us out. Thank you so much, Rebecca, and all of you. This has really been um, amazing, and uh, I'm I'm ready to go out and support the labor movement. Um, this was such a rich conversation; we couldn't address all the questions, but you know that they will inform our programs and resources. You'll receive a short survey um, as soon as you sign off. Please help us learn from your experience by taking a few minutes to fill it out. A link is also available in the chat, and we hope you'll join us for our next webinar on April 11th, which centers disability rights, activism, and organizing, continuing this theme. Thank you again for joining us, and have a great rest of your day.